Hi, my name is Amy Burquist. I am a senior staff attorney with the International Justice Program at the Advocates for Human Rights, and I'm also a vice president of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty. The Advocates for Human Rights serves on the steering committee of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty, and in that capacity, we frequently collaborate with members of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty who want assistance with engaging, with, engaging in advocacy at the United Nations. This video is part of a series of videos designed for members of the World Coalition to build their capacity to engage in United, Na United Nations advocacy. The subject of this video is SMART recommendations. Here's the agenda for this training video. First, we'll go over the function of recommendations in the United Nations human rights system. Then we'll talk a little bit about strategic recommendations that you might want to advocate for in your work. And then we'll go over what smart, smart recommendations are and we'll look at several examples of recommendations to assess whether they are smart or not. So first we'll talk about the function of recommendations, how they work as part of the United Nations human rights mechanisms. Both treaty bodies and the Universal Periodic Review involve recommendations, and it's important to think about how those um, recommendations might be similar or different in the different types of mechanisms. For the Universal Periodic Review, you remember that the delegates to the Human Rights Council who are making their interventions have a very brief period of time. So it's important that any recommendations you're advocating for for the Universal Periodic Review mechanism are concise. They don't have a lot of time to dedicate to go into any particular detail. And these are diplomats right, making the recommendations. They're not subject matter experts. So they typically don't go into a lot of depth about a particular um, human rights area. For the treaty bodies, treaty body experts also issue recommendations at the end of the treaty body review. And the recommendations appear in a document that's typically called concluding observations and recommendations. And the treaty body experts generally make more detailed recommendations. There's usually, a, they, they have more time to dedicate to them. They have a lot more um, interaction with the state party before they formulate the recommendations. And so the recommendations often have a different character from the treaty bodies as compared with the Universal Periodic Review recommendations you'll see. But these recommendations, as you'll see in a little bit, also can interact with one another. And so it's important to keep in mind when you're doing advocacy for the UPR, what recommendations have been made by the treaty bodies most recently. Um, so there is some engagement between the two mechanisms to take into account. Another aspect of the function of recommendations is how they can play a role in your advocacy. At the Advocates for Human Rights, we really recommend for ourselves and for our partner organizations that when we're trying to come up with a strategy for United Nations advocacy, we first start with the recommendations we want to see come out of the process. Because it's really the recommendations that are the most operative part, the most operative outcome of either the treaty body review or the UPR. That's what the government is going to focus on. And that's oftentimes what civil society and the media will focus on is what are the next steps going forward. So if before you start your report writing, your advocacy, if you first focus on the recommendations, then you can build the rest of your advocacy around it. Oftentimes people will you know, do research, write a human rights report, and then come up with the recommendations only at the very end. If possible, it's good to think about recommendations at the very start of your reporting and advocacy, because the recommendations you want to see come out of the process can then shape the issues you decide to focus on in the report how you divide up and organize the report, and can also shape what kind of information you gather and the supporting stories and anecdotes that will support those recommendations. So you can really use recommendations strategically as a way to frame your report and frame your lobbying activities later. So I highly recommend you start by thinking about what recommendations do you want to see coming out of either the Universal Periodic Review or the Treaty Body Review process, and then work your way backwards. So how do you make the case for those recommendations? What's the evidence, the research, the stories and analysis that you need to provide to your audience that would justify those recommendations? And then how do you frame the different issues that you wanna talk about in the report so that everything will lead up to the recommendations that you want to hear them make? 
Next, we'll talk a little bit about strategic recommendations. So in talking about the death penalty, for example, it's easy to um, select as a recommendation, abolish the death penalty, uh, adopt a formal moratorium on the death penalty, death penalty ratify, ratify the second optional protocol to the ICCPR. And those are all good recommendations, but they might not be strategic depending on the status of your country and the context of your country. So we'll talk a little bit now about strategic recommendations um, that you might want to consider advocating for. Um, first of all, there is strength in numbers. So while it's an easy recommendation to come up with, a lot of countries in the UPR, for example, are quite willing to make a recommendation for a formal moratorium on the death penalty or for abolition of the death penalty or ratification of the second optional protocol. And there can be strength in numbers, even if you uh, can see the writing on the wall that your government might not be willing to accept those recommendations, there still can be strength in numbers in the moral force of the number of countries that talked about the death penalty or called for a moratorium, that can have um, a strategic advantage for your advocacy. So it's important to think about that as having value on its own. But it's also important to think about what other recommendations you might want to see, especially in the UPR process, but also coming about out of the treaty body review process. Sometimes I refer to some of these recommendations as an offer you can't refuse. Think about what recommendations would help you and your advocacy for abolition of the death penalty, but that would also be quite awkward or even embarrassing for your government not to accept. I'll give you an example. Uh, in looking at advocacy on Japan for the UPR, we noticed that during the previous cycle of the UPR, the government of Japan had, during the interactive di dialogue, had said, we retain the death penalty because the public in Japan support the death penalty. And so one of the things we lobbied for was a recommendation that I think one of one of the countries we were lobbying took up, a recommendation that the government of Japan engage in a public awareness raising campaign about the death penalty and the issues surrounding the death penalty. So if the government is going to rely on public opinion, then this recommendation really forced the hand of the government of Japan to say, if you're going to rely on public opinion, don't you want that public opinion to be educated? Don't you want it to be informed? So that was an example of a recommendation that was an offer you can't refuse. Uh, so think about are there recommendations that might not immediately lead to abolition of the death penalty, but might open a door for the government to do something that could lead to some positive steps toward abolition. So think strategically about those offers you can't re refuse, those recommendations that could help you in your advocacy and in your work toward ab abolition, but that would be also awkward or embarrassing for your government not to accept. That's one, one category of strategic recommendations. Another category of strategic recommendations has to do with what I was speaking about earlier, which is the connection between treaty body reviews and the UPR. You'll remember that in the treaty body reviews, the state that's being reviewed doesn't have the option of accepting or noting the concluding observations and recommendations. The treaty body simply issues those concluding observations and recommendations and expects that the state party will implement them by the time of the next review. The UPR, however, requires the state under review to accept or note every recommendation that's made. So it's in fact, in fact, getting a UPR recommendation that references directly a recommendation or a concluding observation from a treaty body forces them to go on record to say whether they will agree to do the recommendation that the treaty body made. So that can be a great way to put them on record and it can also be embarrassing because, embarrassing for the government because if a treaty body has made a recommendation for a treaty that the government has ratified, um, and if that recommendation would make, mean a positive step toward abolition of the death penalty and the government notes that recommendation during the UPR, the government knows that the treaty body experts are gonna be offended by that. And so it's really, um, an important strategic consideration to think about whether in your UPR advocacy you want to lobby for implementation of recommendations that a treaty body made. So think strategically about that. It's good to get the government on the record. Another advantage to pushing for recommendations that reference the treaty body recommendations is that it allows the UPR recommendation to be more concise. 
You'll remember I said that the treaty by recommendations go into a lot more detail, um, have, have a lot more thought put into them because the treaty body experts have the capacity to do that. Well, it can be a very concise recommendation for a diplomat to make in the UPR mechanism to say, fully implement the recommendation on this particular topic issued by the Committee Against Torture, for example. So that's a very short recommendation for those diplomats to make with their precious, precious seconds, but it incorporates by reference this much more detailed set of recommendations that is in part of the public record and well and perfectly available to the state under review. So the recommendations that incorporate by reference larger documents are also very um, can be very strategic because they allow the speaker to be concise, but reference larger, larger documents like concluding observations and recommendations. Another thing to think about strategically is incremental change. So it may be that in, for the UPR in the next five years, your government won't abolish the death penalty, but are there smaller things that the government could do that would move toward abolition? So in countries that retain the death penalty as an available punishment for juvenile offenders, for example, removing the death penalty for juvenile offenders is one small step toward abolition that would be a positive change in the country and might be easier for the state under review to accept than outright abolishing the death penalty in its entirety. So think about whether there are smaller changes that might make positive incremental reforms and that might have a better chance of being accepted by the state under review. That's another important thing to think about. And it's also relevant in your advocacy with treaty bodies as well, because treaty bodies uh, experts will um, in, on occasion make recommendations for abolition of the death penalty, but they're also interested in making recommendations that might move the uh, country along the spectrum toward abolition um, in a positive way. So now we'll talk about SMART recommendations. And you may have heard this acronym SMART in other contexts, but it's also relevant in our UN advocacy. So first I'll give you an overview of what the word SMART stands for. Um, the word SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time Bound. And a good recommendation, regardless of whether it's for the UPR or a treaty body mechanism, a good recommendation um, has all five features, all five of those smart features and we'll go into a little depth on each one now. So first a recommendation should be specific. It should give a well-defined action that relates to a specific right or a human rights violation. So something that is specific that is well-defined so you can tell concretely what it is that the state party is expected to do. So let's take a look at a couple of examples to see whether they are specific. So the first is a recommendation from Algeria to Papua New Guinea, and Algeria, and both of these recommendations have to do with detention conditions, so it might be relevant to your reporting. Um, Algeria's recommendation to Papua New Guinea was to undertake effective measures to combat poor detention conditions. Now take a look, think about that recommendation, and is that recommendation specific? Undertake effective measures to combat poor detention conditions. Well, they did add the word effective, so that does make it a bit more specific, but do we know what those measures are? Do we know what action is being expected of the government of Papua New Guinea? It's really not clear. Let's take a look at the recommendation on the right, which was recommendation Belgium made to North Korea. Belgium recommended that North Korea invite the special rapporteur, and I think earlier in the statement they mentioned which special rapporteur they had in mind, and or an international humanitarian organization recognized for its independence to visit reform institutions and other correctional and penitentiary institutions to assess and evaluate detention conditions with a view to proposing measures to improve these conditions so that they meet international norms and standards. Now, that to me is an extremely specific recommendation. It does give a choice to the government, either invite the special rapporteur or an international humanitarian organization, but it can't just be any organization. It has to be an organization that's recognized for its independence. And what will be the purpose of the invitation? To visit these reform in institutions and other institutions, and not just what they're going to do, but what, what the purpose of those visit is, the visits will be, to assess the detention conditions with a view to is like so there's a specific purpose to propose measures to improve the conditions so that they meet international norms and standards. So it's a much more specific recommendation on the right. 
And you'll also see it oftentimes takes more time to make a specific recommendation than a vague recommendation. So it is a trade off that delegates to the Human Rights Council have to make is that if, if I'm more specific, then it's going to take up more time and I don't necessarily have the time to do that. So that is a trade off. But I also say that when we engage in our advocacy, we may recognize that some governments don't like to make specific recommendations or don't like to make smart recommendations. They may prefer weaker recommendations. But we will nonetheless, in our advocacy, always propose smart recommendations because the smart recommendations are a good starting point. And if the country we're lobbying to make a recommendation decides to water it down and make it weaker, that's up to them to do. We're not going to help them out by proposing weak recommendations in the first place. So that's specific. Let's go on to our next word, measurable. So a recommendation is measurable if it can be assessed. So if you can tell during at the end of the reporting period, was the recommendation implemented or was it not? And it's good to focus here on actions, concrete steps to take rather than the result that you're hoping to achieve, like better respect for human rights. So focus on concrete actions that one can measure to see whether it's implemented. Now we'll take a look at another couple of examples. So the first example, we're trying to assess whether it's measurable, was a recommendation from France to Iran. And France recommended ensure the independence of the judicial system and ensure the rules of fair trial and the rights of, def of the defense. So think about that recommendation and tell me whether you think it's measurable. And this is an example of a recommendation that focuses on what the end result is rather than the concrete steps to get there. Obviously, France wants Iran to achieve independence in the judiciary and respect fair trial rights. That's the end result. But France doesn't tell Iran what steps Iran should be taking to achieve those goals. So France's recommendation is really not measurable. There's no way to tell after the UPR period has completed, whether Iran has implemented that recommendation. There's, there's no way to assess that. Let's take a look at the recommendation on the right. This is a recommendation from Belgium to Thailand. Um, and again, it has to do with fair trial rights, another theme that might be relevant for your death penalty reporting. So Belgium recommended to Thailand that Thailand repeal order three slash 2015 of the National Council for Peace and Order and ensure that all civilians are tried before a civilian court and granted the right to fair trial in line with Thailand's obligations as a part, state party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So think about that and whether that recommendation is measurable, whether there are any parts of it there are and parts that aren't. So looking at the first part of the recommendation, repeal a specific order that can we measure in, by, the, by the start of the next UPR whether Thailand has done that? Certainly, it's easy to say, does this, order still, it, does this order still exist under law or has it been repealed? That's measurable. How about the next part? Ensure that all civilians are tried before a civilian court. Can you measure that? Probably, because you have civilians and you have military personnel and you can take a look at all civilians and the criminal trials that have happened and see, did any of those criminal trials happen before a military court or were they all before civilian courts? So again, that's easy to measure. It's either yes or no. Maybe there are some exceptions. And so we could say that the government Thailand hasn't implemented that recommendation. But then let's look at the next part of the recommendation. It would also to ensure that all civilians are granted the right to fair trial in line with Thailand's obligations as a state party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now being granted a right to fair trial is more like France's recommendation to Iran. We don't quite know what it means to be granted a right to fair trial. That's more focusing on what the end result is rather than concrete steps. Although Belgium did make an effort by referencing in the recommendation, the obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So that does give us more substance to the fair trial rights that we might go through the relevant articles of the ICCPR to measure whether Thailand complied with that. But even then, that last part of the recommendation is much harder to, re to measure than the first two parts of Belgium's recommendation. The next letter in our SMART acronym is achievable. 
And the word achievable can be interpreted in a lot of ways, but what we mean when we say it's an achievable recommendation is, is it something the state is capable of implementing? So there might be, for example, financial constraints. It might be fiscally impossible or technologically impossible for the state to implement a particular recommendation. What we're not talking about in terms of achievable is whether there's the political will to do something, because that political will could always um, make a recommendation fail. So we don't consider a smart recommendation to be only a recommendation where there's the pol political will to do something. We want to be able to use recommendations to push governments to do better than they're already capable of doing. So don't, don't, change a recommendation under the achievable standard to make it only something that is currently palatable to the authorities. That's not what we mean by achievable. We just mean whether, given the political will, is the state capable financially, technologically of implementing the recommendation. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So, Take a look at the example on the left. This is a recommendation from Canada to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Canada recommended that TNT enact a comprehensive prison and related judicial reform to ensure that conditions of detention are in conformity with the UN minimum, the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, including but not limited to addressing overcrowding and sanitary issues in prisons, providing sufficient resources for rehabilitation and reintegration of prisoners, and relieving the judicial backlog that has contributed to the detention of over 2,000 people in remand awaiting trial, many who have been in custody for several years. So is that achievable by the government of Trinidad and Tobago? It's possible, but I would say that probably in the context of the UPR in five years to enact comprehensive uh, prison and reform to accomplish all of those goals, might not be achievable even with the political will. Now, it does have a lot of specificity in that recommendation, but I think you could argue that this uh, recommendation is asking for too much of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, um, given the time frame of the UPR. Um, take a look at the recommendation on the right, a recommendation from Switzerland to China. Switzerland recommended publicize the statistics on ex execution. Is that something China is capable of doing? Certainly. Certainly China has access to that information and it would be just a matter of publicizing the information it has. That's actually very achievable regardless of whether China has the political will to publicize those executions because of course we know the government of China is quite secretive about the death penalty and the number of executions making it very difficult for uh, the World Coalition and other advocates of abolition to um, assess the level of the death penalty, the level of executions in China. So the Switzerland recommendation is definitely achievable. It's something that would practically with the flip of a switch, the government of China would be able to comply. The R in our SMART acronym is the word relevant. And relevant simply means that the recommendation is connected to the situation in the country. It's something that human rights defenders and non-governmental organizations would care about. It would make a difference in the work that they do. And it would be something that would be meaningful for advancing human rights. So most recommendations that civil society organizations like yours are advocating for are of course gonna be relevant. You wouldn't be spending your time on them if they weren't relevant. But we'll take a look at a, at a couple of examples anyways, just for fun. Take a look at the re example on the left, which is a re recommendation from the Democratic Republic of the Congo to the United States, again about the death penalty. The DRC recommended that the USA strengthen the justice sector in order to avoid imposing the death penalty on those persons wrongfully convicted and reconsider the use of methods which give rise to cruel suffering when this punishment is applied. So that's certainly relevant because in the United States, there is a, a, an ongoing issue of wrongful convictions and people being sentenced to death wrongly. And uh, there are issues with respect to the method of execution in the United States as well, people being subjected to lethal injection protocols that subject them to torture and unnecessary suffering. So certainly those are relevant recommendations from the DRC to the United States. Take a look at the recommendation on the right from Egypt, a retentionist country, to Afghanistan. Egypt recommends that Afghanistan continue using its sovereign right to apply the death penalty as a tool of criminal justice in accordance with proper safeguards specified under international human rights law. Is this relevant 
Well, for human rights defenders on the ground in Afghanistan, probably not. It probably doesn't advance human rights. It's probably not something that human rights defenders in Afghanistan would be advocating for, the continued use of the death penalty. It's not really something um, that, that would fall under the category as of relevant for United Nations advocacy. And of course, we can expect that the government of Egypt is making this recommendation not as a means to advance human rights in Afghanistan, but more as a political statement because Egypt wants to assert its sovereign right to retain the death penalty and continue, ex continue to execute people as well. So that's an example of a non-relevant or less relevant recommendation. The final part of our SMART acronym is time bound. Now, a recommendation uh, that is SMART and time bound means that it has a time frame for implementation. There is some endpoint by which uh, the recipient of the recommendation is expected to have implemented the recommendation. Now, with both the Universal Periodic Review and the Treaty Body Review process, it's the time re restraint is implicit. It's implied, if, if it doesn't state otherwise, that the recommendation will be impl implemented before the next review. So for the UPR, it will be in five years time for the treaty bodies whenever the next treaty body review is supposed to happen. So you often don't need to put that time constraint into your recommendation because it's already assumed by all the parties who are part of the discussion. But it's okay to, to include shorter deadlines as well. If there's a pressing recommendation, something that you would like to see done more immediately, it can be good to add a time constraint to that recommendation. So we won't take a look at any examples here because the time bound aspect of the recommendations is usually built into the context of the review. But as a refresher, here's our, here's our SMART acronym. A SMART recommendation is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So now we'll take a look at some recommendations. I'll have you read them and then we'll discuss whether those recommendations are SMART or not SMART. And these are all recommendations that are relevant to the death penalty, either the death penalty itself or fair trial rights or detention conditions, for example. So take a look at the recommendations up on the screen and think about whether they are SMART or maybe not so SMART. I'll give you time to read them and then we'll discuss whether we think it complies with all five letters of the SMART acronym or whether there are some aspects of SMART that aren't being satisfied by a particular recommendation. But I'll give you some time to read now. Okay, let's take a look. First, we'll lead off with Belgium's recommendation to China. Belgium recommends that China publish or make available precise information on the identity and number of the individuals currently awaiting execution and of those who were executed in the past year. Is this smart or not so smart? First, is it specific? I think the recommendation probably satisfies the recommendation, uh, the, the the requirement of specificity. We, we, we want them to publish or make, make available. Now make available is kind of a mushy phrase. It's not clear whether it's make available to the public or make available to whom. So Belgium could be better about um, specifying make available to whom. Um, and it says precise information. So they're trying to be, uh, add a specific word um, there as well. But we, Belgium wants the identity and number of individuals. So the names of the people and how many individuals are currently awaiting execution and who have been executed, not just generally, but in the past year. So that's a nice time constraint. They're not asking China to provide data going back for decades, but just in the past year. We just want to you know, give, give us information about the last year and the death penalty. So it's relatively specific. Is it measurable? Can you tell whether China has done this or not? With publishing, probably. You can see whether the data has been, pu the data have been published, but making available, again, is hard to measure. How do you know whether China has made that available? Made it available to whom? So perhaps it's not measurable. 
um, is it achievable? Is it something that China could implement if it um, decided to do so? Certainly, it's easy enough to publish information. You can put it up on the website. You can print a report. That's definitely achievable. Is it relevant? Is it something that would be relevant to folks working on human rights, working toward abolition of the death penalty? Yes, of course, we are. We would love to have that information about the death penalty in China, something that um, human rights organizations around the world have struggled with is not being able to access that information. And of course, it's time bound because it's in the context of the UPR, it's expected to be implemented in the next five years. So not too bad for Belgium, but there is some room for improvement. Now let's take a look at another Belgium recommendation, this one to the United States. Belgium recommends the United States take specific measures in follow-up to the recommendations of the Human Rights Committee to the United States in 2014 with regards to capital punishment, such as measures to avoid racial bias, to avoid wrongful sentencing to death, and to provide adequate compensation if wrongful sentencing happens. So, is it specific? Well, it says specific, it says take specific measures, but it say, does it say what measures to take? It says to follow up on the recommendations from the Human Rights Committee, but we don't necessarily know what those measures are. One thing we would want to do to determine whether this recommendation is really specific is go back and look at those recommendations from the Human Rights Committee. Remember I mentioned that one good strategic way to make a recommendation is to make a UPR recommendation that cross-references the recommendations a treaty body made. And this is a great example of Belgium doing exactly that. So it may be specific, but we would want to look at what the treaty body said to see whether those recommendations are specific as well. Is it measurable? Can you tell, could you tell whether the United States implemented this recommendation? Well, it says take specific measures. And how would you know whether a specific measure was taken, whether the United States did something specific? Um, it might be difficult to, to say, to measure whether a specific measure was taken. Um, like what would be a measure to avoid ra racial bias? Could you point specifically to a measure that the government of the United States had taken? Um, it might be a bit vague the way the recommendation is worded there. Then let's think about whether it's achievable. Is it, is it achievable that the government of the United States could do these things within a five-year period? Certainly those things are all achievable that the government could implement recommendations regarding avoiding racial bias, uh, taking measures to avoid racial bias. Certainly you can't eliminate it with a snap of your hand, but you can certainly take measures to avoid or reduce the incidence of racial bias and wrongful sentencing and providing adequate compensation for wrongful sentencing as well. So those are definitely achievable. Is it uh, relevant? Are these uh, recommendations things that are relevant to um, human rights organizations, to the advancement of human rights? Yes, of course. These are things that uh, those of us in the United States who are working for abolition of the death penalty would love to see happen. And it's time bound, of course, in the context of the UPR. Now let's take a look at the third recommendation. Strengthen the justice sector in order to avoid imposing the death penalty on those persons wrongfully, wrongly convicted and reconsider the use of methods which give rise to cruel suffering when this punishment is applied. This is a recommendation we already mentioned briefly, the DRC recommending to the United States. Now we said that this recommendation is relevant, so we don't need to go into further analysis there. Is it specific? Can we tell what concrete steps are being called for, or is it calling for an end result without defining what those steps would be to achieve that end result? And here, I think it's, it falls into the second category. It's really calling for end results without the steps to accomplish them. Strengthen the Justice Center is quite vague. It's not specific. It doesn't tell us what concretely the government should do. And similarly, it's not measurable. How can we measure whether the, the Justice se Sector has been strengthened? Um, now, can we measure whether it's been strengthened to avoid imposing the death penalty on those persons wrongfully convicted? Um, and another thing that is not specific or measurable is reconsider the use of methods which give rise to cruel suffering when this punishment is applied. You'll see a lot of recommendations in the UPR use this word consider consider doing this, consider doing that. And those are very vague recommendations that really don't ask much of the state receiving the recommendation. To consider doing something is simply think about it. And the state can then say, yes, we thought about it, we considered it, and we decided not to do it. 
that means they can claim credit for implementing a recommendation because all the recommendation asked was to consider something. It didn't ask them actually to take any step other than just sitting and thinking about something for a brief moment. So the word consider or reconsider is a word that a lot of diplomats like to use because it softens the recommendation. It makes it more likely the recommendation will be accepted, but it also means that the recommendation is essentially meaningless because it's not asking the state really to do anything of any cons consequence. Let's take a look at some additional recommendations. These recommendations have to do with detention conditions. So I'd like you to, I'll give you some time to read both recommendations and then we'll talk about whether they are smart or not. All right, let's take a look at the United Kingdom's recommendation to Thailand. The United Kingdom recommends that Thailand in line with the rules 83 through 85 of the United Nations standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, the Nelson Mandela rules, to create an external independent inspection body that has access to all categories of prisoners in all places of detention that are under the Ministry of Justice. Is that smart? Well, is it specific? Well, it does call for an independent, in, external independent inspection body, but not just that, but it references the rules, the Nelson Mandela rules. This is, a, again, remember, it's another way to cross-reference more substantive information to make a shorter recommendation that includes by reference these rules. And the Nelson Mandela rules are a great example of a way to make a shorter recommendation with a lot of punch to it. Um, so it's quite specific um, and that the body must have access to all categories of prisoners in all places of detention that are under the Ministry of Justice. So it's quite specific. Um, is it measurable? Can you tell whether the government of Thailand has created this inspection body? Yes, in five years time, you can turn to the government of Thailand and say, did you create this inspection body? And then you can look at the terms that establish the inspection body to see whether they, they comply with what the Nelson Mandela rules say. So it's pr pretty easy to assess whether it's been achieved or not. It's quite measurable. Um, and is it achievable? Is this something that the government of Thailand is capable of doing over the course of the next five years? Certainly it could establish this inspection body, ensure that it has the powers that are set forth in the Nelson Mandela rules. Definitely it's achievable. Is it relevant? Yes, of course, it's quite relevant if there are allegations of ill treatment of prisoners. It's quite relevant to create this inspection body that can inspect um, the prisons, have access to the prisoners to ascertain whether they're being ill treated. And of course, it's time bound in the context of the UPR. Let's take a look at the second recommendation, and this is from Thailand to Mozambique. Thailand recommends, and again, another recommendation referencing the Nelson Mandela rules, the, Thailand recommends that Mozambique intensif intensify its efforts to ensure that national prison rules and policies are in line with the revised United Nations Standard Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners or the Nelson Mandela Rules. Now this recommendation, while it cross-references the Nelson Mandela Rules, it's not particularly specific. Compare it to the, the recommendation from the UK, which references specific rules, says spe specifically what is to be implemented, you know concretely what the government is supposed to do. Here, Thailand to Mozambique doesn't go into any detail. It just says, here's this entire set of rules, this entire set of rules for treatment of prisoners, and intensify your efforts to ensure that those policies and rules for the prisons are in line with those rules. So it's definitely a, a much less specific recommendation than the one, the one you see from the UK. Is it measurable? Would we be able to tell whether Mozambique has intensified those efforts? How can we measure intensity of efforts? It's really difficult. I think it'd be quite a challenge after five years to say, okay, Mozambique, how hard did you work on ensuring that your prison rules and policies align with the Nelson Mandela rules? It's, it's too mushy a uh, determinant to be able to say, yes, it's definitely measurable. Is it achievable? Is it something that the government of Mozambique could achieve in the next five years to inten intensify efforts? Sure, the, the government could intensify its efforts. That's something that it, it could do. Um, 
It's just really more a concern about whether we can measure that it has actually been achieved. Is it relevant? Certainly the Nelson Mandela rules for the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners are relevant to improving and enhancing prison conditions in any country. So it's definitely relevant and of course time bound as well. Next, we'll go through one more set of examples, and these have to do with fair trial rights, which again may be relevant to your advocacy about the death penalty in your country. The first recommendation is from Israel to North Korea, and Israel recommended that North Korea enshrine fully the right to fair trial and due process guarantees. Now, this is a good example of a vague recommendation, one that's, that states the end goal without stating the steps to accomplish that end goal. So it's not specific. Similarly, it's not measurable. There's no way to tell whether North Korea has enshrined those rights and guarantees. Um, is it achievable? Probably. If the, you know, certainly uh, there aren't any cost barriers to a fair trial that would, would be standing in North Korea's way. Um, and it's certainly relevant and time bound, but it's really falling short on the specific and measurable aspects of the SMART requirement. Then let's take a look at that Thailand to Mozambique rule. We've already visited, visited that one in the previous slide. Next, let's take a look at Canada's recommendation to Vietnam. Take the necessary measures to guarantee its citizens' rights to equality before the law, to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, and to a fair and public trial, as well as the right to freedom from arbitrary arrest or detention. So take the necessary measures, that's sort of a, a, the, your red lights should be flashing to say that that's not specific. Take the necessary measures. Who Do we know what those measures are? Do we given any definition to what the steps are? So this is an example of Canada not going the extra um, distance to give specificity to a recommendation. They're saying take the necessary measures and it's really up to Vietnam to say, oh, that wasn't necessary, so we didn't do it. So it's not specific. And similarly, it's not measurable because how do you know whether those measures have been taken? You might say, well, it is measurable because you can look at each trial and see whether each citizen's right to equality before the law, to be presumed innocent, to have a fair and public trial and freedom from arbitrary arrest or detention. You can see whether those things have happened and that's the way you can measure it. But that's really unwieldy to say all of these end results and we want to ensure that in every case all of these end results have been accomplished. So it's again difficult to measure whether Vietnam would have uh, implemented those recommendations. But like the other recommendations, it's definitely something that is, well, probably something that is achievable to uh, ensure everyone's right to equality before the law, to be presumed innocent, to a fair and public trial, and to be free from arbitrary arrest or detention certainly relevant for people on the ground in Vietnam and time bound. Let's look at this last recommendation before we wrap up. This is a recommendation from Jordan to Saudi Arabia. And Jordan recommends that Saudi Arabia continue enhancing the principle of public trials and monitoring them in a way that does not contradict the independence of the judiciary and fair trials, including allowing the public to attend court hearings. Is this specific? Well, I think part of it is the last part of the recommendation is quite specific by allowing the public to attend court hearings. That's quite specific. We know exactly what that means, that any member of the public can go into a court hearing and attend. So that part is specific. The first part of the recommendation is not necessarily very specific at all. Enhancing the principle of public trials, we don't really know what that means other than allowing the public to attend court hearings and monitoring them in a way that does not contradict the independence of the judiciary and fair trials. It's also not clear. It seems as though Jordan is suggesting there might be some tension between having a public trial and having an independent judiciary and a fair trial. So that is not specific and it's in, in fact the language is somewhat confusing. Is it measurable? Well I think the second part of the recommendation allowing the public to attend court hearings is measurable. You can look at all the hearings that happen over the next five years and see whether the public was allowed to attend. But the other part of the monitoring the trials in a way that doesn't contradict the independence of the judiciary and fair trials, I wouldn't know how to go to the go on the ground in Saudi Arabia and assess whether that recommendation had been implemented. It seems a little tricky for um, measuring. <laughs> 
um, is it achievable? Is this something that the government of Saudi Arabia could achieve in the next five years? The go government could continue enhancing those principles and monitoring the, the trials. Um, certainly something that the government could achieve in a five-year period. Is it relevant? Yes, fair, fair public trials, monitoring, uh, supporting the independence of the judiciary and fair trial rights. Those are all things that would be relevant and of course time-bound in the context of the UPR. So I hope these examples have given you some ideas about getting started on your own recommendations for your own context, looking at what your priority issues and concerns are in your countries. So if you start with the recommendations, that will help you fill in the relevant factual information and the examples you want to provide in your reports to justify the recommendations that you're shooting for. Another good practice I want to mention is if you're finished with a report for the United Nations, go over that report and ensure that for every problem or issue the report has identified, you have proposed at least one recommendation that would solve that problem or reduce the incidence of that problem. It's a really good practice in the report writing process to make sure that there's a match between the description of the problems on the ground and the recommendations you're proposing. You want to make sure that for every problem you, pr you describe, you have at least one recommendation that would work towards solving that, that problem. If there's not a match, then then you want to cut out either one thing or the other. You want to cut out a recommendation that doesn't have any factual basis for it or cut out the factual information if there's no recommendation you want to propose that would solve it. Similarly, if you have a recommendation but there's no discussion of it in the body of your report, add that discussion. So you might have a recommendation and then forget to talk about it in the substance of your report. Be sure that there's a factual basis for each recommendation so you, we sh you can show in the report, here's the reason we need this recommendation. So that's the end of this training. I hope you found it useful. Um, if you would like to reach out to me with any questions, you see my email address and telephone number up on the screen. And again, I recommend you use our resource, Human Rights Tools for a Changing World, for further information about advocacy, um, human rights fact-finding documentation and advocacy, and particularly chapter nine, which focuses on advocacy at the United Nations. Thanks for joining us for this training, and I hope to see you again next time.